US Air Force will be launching its mysterious X-37 from a Falcon 9 rocket on September 7th. The launch is no secret. What is secret is what it will be doing up there in space. This will be the fifth flight of the craft, and as with the last flights, its mission is classified. Each flight has been longer than the last, with the most recent lasting nearly two years in orbit. The unmanned space plane is similar in appearance to the space shuttle, however much smaller. It is 29 feet in length and 9.5 feet tall. It has a wingspan of 15 feet and a payload bay of 7 feet by 4 feet. Inside the payload bay is carried a solar panel for power and can carry 5 to 600 pounds of equipment. The X-37 is a grandchild of the X-20 Dinosaur. The Dinosaur was a U.S. Air Force manned space plane designed in the 1950s. The government eventually canceled the project due to cost and technology limitations and went with the capsule design to launch the first Americans into space. A few decades after the Dinosaur came the ReFly, or the reusable flyback satellite. This vehicle appears very similar to the X-37. The craft was designed by Rockwell International, which was then acquired by Boeing, who used the design to construct the X-37. NASA awarded Boeing funding to develop a reusable spacecraft for testing and to repair satellites in orbit. In 2004, the program was transferred to DARPA, which is a government agency which develops and studies advanced and future technologies. At that point, the X-37 became classified and eventually taken over by the U.S. Air Force. Again, what the X-37 is doing up there is secret. The Air Force's official explanation is that the spacecraft is designed to perform risk reduction, experimentation, and concept of operational development for reusable spacecraft technologies. So far, only two experiments on board have been publicly acknowledged. A NASA material science experiment and an ion thruster being used for future spacecraft propulsion. Any attempt to figure out what other uses the X-37 is being used for must take into account a few clues. First, the craft is under control of the military, not NASA. Therefore, it must have some sort of military application. Second, its flights have all been very long in duration. Whatever they are testing requires long exposure to space. Third, it has a lot of fuel. The original design called for 3,100 meters per second of delta V. Delta V is basically the measure of how much you can maneuver in space. The space shuttle, for comparison, only had about 300 meters per second delta-v. This larger amount of fuel could indicate that the craft is meant to rendezvous with satellites or to get into position to fly over a certain area of the Earth. Fourth, all flights have been in low Earth orbit, typically lower than 250 miles in altitude. This low orbit is used for many commercial satellites, several military recon satellites, and manned space missions. And finally, it is reusable. Reusability comes at a high cost. The heat shield, landing gear, navigation equipment, etc. are very heavy, which really limits the payload that it can carry into space. The spacecraft in total weighs 11,000 pounds, while its payload is only about 500 pounds, so whatever is being launched in its payload bay must be very important to not only bring back, but also to have the space plane be able to be used again. With these in mind, there are several guesses as to the X-37B's purpose. The X-20 Dinosaur was originally considered to be used as a bomber, with a crew of three on board that would launch into orbit armed with several nuclear bombs. They would then re-enter the atmosphere, drop the bombs, and return home using a jet engine. If the X-37 is a bomber, it could sit in orbit for years, and once the signal is given, change its orbit to target a location, release its weapons, and return home. The space plane's development also coincides with the U.S.'s development of its prompt global strike program whose goal is to be able to strike anywhere in the world in less than one hour. However, this application is unlikely due to its small payload capacity, and it would also violate the 1967 Outer Space Treaty which bans placing weapons of mass destruction into orbit. Many people have stated they believe that the X-37's purpose may be to destroy or disable enemy satellites. It could maneuver to get in close and either use lasers or kinetic weapons against the target. It makes sense that some people would think this, as the X-37's original purpose was to rendezvous with satellites and repair them. However, despite having a large amount of fuel for maneuvering, it still does not have enough to make this likely. Also, the military wouldn't need a reusable spacecraft for this. It makes much more sense to have a dedicated spacecraft, weighing all 11,000 pounds, with more fuel to complete the task, than it does to only have 500 pounds worth of gear that could fit in the back of the space plane. The X-37 may be being used for reconnaissance. The craft would carry an array of cameras and sensors to spy on an enemy nation. 
its extra fuel could be used to change its orbit to get into position to fly over a target. This could prove beneficial compared to conventional recon satellites that fly in very predictable orbits, and an enemy can simply hide any sensitive material when one passes overhead. Typically, recon satellites have been very large and bulky. However, companies like Planet Labs have developed their Dove CubeSats that are less than one foot in length and only four inches wide and in width. These small satellites can produce relatively high resolution images of the Earth for their size. And finally, the last and least exciting is that the X-37B is simply being used for research. After all, this is what the US government has been claiming all along. The craft could carry various experiments on board to see how it reacts to long-term exposure in outer space. Testing could include new armor and shields to protect against micrometeorites, the effects of long-duration spaceflight on various systems, and testing out future methods of spacecraft propulsion. The infamous EM drive, which seems to defy the laws of physics, has been rumored to be being tested on the craft. This operation seems to be the most likely use of the X-37, considering all the information available. However, only time will tell what benefit the space plane will bring to the U.S. Air Force. Stable at step three. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus 30 seconds and counting. ECS reduced for launch. Roger. 25. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go AF Space 5. 20. 15. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have RD-180 ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance 8 SPC-5 payload with the Atlas V launch vehicle for the United States Air Force. Disturbances are as expected. You're now hearing the voice of Rob Gannon providing launch vehicle ascent data. Let's listen in for mission progress. Everything is looking good. Passing 30 seconds into flight, everything looks good. Flight control is nice and smooth. About 50 seconds into the mission, everything looks good. Flight controls right down the middle, doing normal disturbances for atmospheric flight. Everything is looking good. Operating parameters look good, vehicle disturbances look good. Open loop steering has been active for a while. Looking just fine. Coming up on Mach 1, and OTV is now supersonic. Passing through Max-Q, vehicle disturbances continue to be as expected. We have throttled down to 95% of rated thrust right on time. Body rates are smoothing out. Engine operating parameters continue to look good. Operate at 95% rated thrust. 20 seconds to enabling steering. Vehicles flying normally. Engines operating good. And we're proceeding right down the center of the range track, right as expected. Coming up on steering enabled. And we've enabled steering. Vehicles maneuvering. We are now 25 miles in altitude, 15 miles downrange, traveling at 3,000 miles per hour. Parameters continue to look good. 
We're now throttling the engine to maintain a constant 2.5 Gs for payload fairing jettison, and we fired the pyro valve by activating the reaction control system on the second stage. Everything's looking good. Continuing to maintain 2.5 Gs in preparation for fairing jettison. Engine continues to throttle as expected to maintain 2.5 Gs. Parameters looking good. Coming up on payload fairing jettison. Everything looking good. Getting ready for fairing. We had fairing set. And CFR deck has jettisoned as well. Engine is throttling back up to 80% rated thrust, right as expected. Vehicle's operating normally. We've started boost phase chill down. We're now entering our constant 4.6 G acceleration phase in preparation for shutdown. Everything looking good. Coming up on shutdown. Boost phase chill has terminated as expected. We have cut off. Booster engine cutoff coming up on staging. And we have stage separation. Everything looking good. We have pre-start on locks and fuel. Ignition, full thrust. The RL-10 is up and running normally. Good start signature. Operating parameters for the RL-10 look good. Vehicle continues to fly right down the center of the range track. Everything this is Atlas Mission Control at T plus five minutes and one second into the flight. We've just heard Rob Gannon report the successful execution of events comprising the early portion of today's mission, and all systems continue to operate nominally. With the mission underway, let's take a look at video.